In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. He is with me. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Cilicia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now, the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness ah! came over him, and he groped ah! about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Ah! When the proconsul saw ah! what happened, he believed, ah! for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Ah! From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel, and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. He endured their conduct for about 40 years in the desert. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king. And he gave them Saul, son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you think I am? I'm not that one, no. But he is coming after me, whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Brothers, children of Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. 
Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. The fact that God raised him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words. I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is stated elsewhere. You will not let your holy one see decay. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his fathers and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. <laughs> Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. <sighs> Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers wonder and perish. For I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe. Even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and welcome back. Uh, we are, like the video showed you, we are starting to hit the road. Uh, we're hitting the road with Barnabas, uh, John Mark, and this guy named Saul. And uh, we, we left yesterday. Uh, with uh, Paul and Barnabas going back to Antioch, and we find ourselves in chapter 13 in Antioch. And, 13 and chapter 13 and 14 are really going to be the first missionary journey. Now, you notice I didn't say the first missionary journey of Paul. <laughs> we'll see. So let's talk about this, Gary. Um, they get back to Antioch, and... Uh, we get this big list of people, uh, you know, some interesting characters, uh, you know, but they, they're doing something that is going to lead to them getting a message. So uh, what, what do we make of all these people that we hear about, what they're doing? 
and, and how it leads to them basically hitting the road. Um, who are these people? <laughs> yeah, it, it'd be worth uh, for somebody to just take that first verse and to look up those people and what uh, could be known just from their names mm -hmm. and their associations and the places they come from, because this is a, a typical of that uh, Antioch church. These folks are from all kinds of places, uh, Africa and uh, Cyprus and Greece. And one of them was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, Herod the Tetrarch uh, may have been, had to spend a lot of time in Rome. So this person may have grown up with him in Rome rather than in the, so, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And then there's, uh, Saul, who is, remember, uh, from what would be modern-day Turkey, from Tarsus, and so he's a Hellenistic Jew or an international person himself, and uh, this, this is the place where this is happening. It's the, uh, it's a crossroads again on uh, uh, the trade routes uh, in uh, east and west and north and south, and to the Mediterranean and the Roman Empire, and then on east into several different empires. So it's an amazing place. There's people from all over, and this small group of prophets and teachers uh, are uh, together and uh, ministering together, evidently, and they're worshiping and fasting. Yes. They're, they're, and, and that's something we need to pause and realize that um, if our uh, congregations are going to go anywhere uh, and do anything for the Lord, uh, they need to be worshiping and fasting together uh, on some way, shape, or form uh, to be able to have that prayer power going, to be paying attention to the Lord and what the Holy Spirit would like to say to us uh, to get us to get up and go uh, when we're ready. That There's an old saying that uh, we interrupt our, what we're doing during the day to pray and in this uh, first century church they interrupted them praying to get them to go do something like this uh, and it was in prayer uh, that things happened in the room to uh, in chapters one and two in acts to get this flying and it happens here where there's a group of people praying and worshiping and fasting over a period of time and uh, God has something to say and sets uh, Barnabas and Saul apart. Now, as well as you know, uh, uh, you know, probably other things that are going on. This story follows Barnabas and Saul, but you can imagine all the other ministries and things going on in, in Antioch. Well, the one line um, in in verse two really takes our modern conception of worship and puts it on its ear mm. because it, it to me it's it, it does at least and that says while they were ministering to the lord <laughs> you know uh, mm. sometimes mm. yeah that that's that's an interesting uh, translation yeah because yeah, because sometimes we think of going to church as consumption right what we're getting what we're getting you know it, you know we want to be entertained we want the music to be wonderful and that sermon better only be about 20 minutes <laughs> so that we can fellowship and 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 get on to the football game but this turns it on its ear and that is ministering to the lord and prayer and fasting and that's that's a nice, that's, that's probably the way we should be thinking about it. We're going to church on a Sunday, not for what we can get out of it, but mm -hmm. what we can give to the Lord. And, mm -hmm. and that's a, that'll preach. I don't know if anybody wants to listen to it, but, <laughs> but that, that, that could preach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amen. So, so, you know, they're ministering to the Lord, they're fasting, and then the Holy Spirit says something to them. And I think 
boy, there's another message. Uh, do we sit still long enough to hear from the Holy Spirit? You know, are, are we silent enough? Are we in the right uh, frame of mind to actually get the message that's coming from the Holy Spirit? So they get a message from the Holy Spirit, and it basically says, what? Yeah, that, that small group is uh, praying, and they get that message, and then it, the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me these two people, uh, for I have called them. Uh, there's a work that they have to do. And now they don't just lay hands on them and send them off, do they? The next verse, verse three is, so after they had fasted and prayed, and you could add the word some more. Yeah. I mean, it was like, okay, the, as they bring this to the, uh, the wider church, uh, the, they're saying, let's pray and fast about this some more and, and keep listening to see, is the Lord going to do that? And then they place their hands on them and send them off. And, uh, you know, wow, uh, it's pretty amazing that uh, Antioch, again, becomes a sending church. Uh, they had sent a donation earlier by Barnabas and Saul, and now they're doing it again. Um, and I'll, I'll make a point here as this uh, story uh, transpired. You might have noticed it as you watched the video itself uh, or heard the scripture uh, narrated for us there. But the story starts off with these, uh, with Barnabas always being first and Saul being second or last. Uh, by the end of this uh, chapter, uh, Paul will be first, not Saul, but Paul, and Barnabas uh, second. And so uh, it's uh, interesting. Uh, you see right here, this ministry team uh, change. Uh, it's a leadership, if you will. And it's, uh, remember, it's, it's Barnabas's initiative to go find Saul to take him to this amazing uh, community of faith, this church that's like dynamic and going. And uh, by the end of it, uh, and I believe it's both Paul's uh, uh, coming into his own that Barnabas recognized this would be the place it would happen. And Barnabas's wisdom as a mentor to allow, uh, see that to happen. But in a step back and let it happen, there's that, we talked about that mentoring uh, saying about, uh, you know, when you mentor somebody, the easy formula abbreviated is, uh, you, I'm going to do it and you watch me, and then uh, you're going to be doing it and I'll be watching you. And then you turn the person loose after that. And uh, this, I think Barnabas is, uh, I think, intentionally doing that here uh, in that they go out there together. Paul, uh, he knows Paul's gifts and Paul steps into it big time and uh, he He's the leader of the, the uh, missionary group at that point. Yeah, and I, and I, I don't think we can underestimate, like you say, the wisdom of Barnabas, because uh, it takes a very special human being to uh, basically be able to encourage someone and get out of, I mean, I hate to say it this way, but get out of their way, right. you know? Because a lot of times there's a lot of a person a personalities out there that can can do the work but never wants to bring somebody along and let them follow and then let them lead and launch them and that's a special uh, special thing and so and then they where they go and maybe you're you're heading there's the first place they go is Barnabas's home island. Uh, that he he's got the connections he's got the ends he's got the the ways uh, and the people uh, to be able to lead into that place but then to be able to comfortably step back and uh, see that transition happen and uh, you can't uh, overestimate the on an island particularly uh, if you've ever lived on an island or even traveling on an island here and there uh, Joyce and I uh, worked for a a uh, international relief uh, nonprofit for a while in the fundraising end of it and would throw uh, the fundraisers a walkathon 
uh, for them in, in various towns in Texas. And one place we got to do that was uh, on Galveston Island. And uh, uh, one thing we learned quickly while we were there in talking to the people there is the people who were born and raised on the island, there was a special uh, acronym, it was B-O-I, a boy. They just say it that way, but it was uh, born on the island. And uh, if they gave them a lot more credit. And we weren't born on the island, but we sure enough found the people that were that were interested in that ministry and, uh, you know, worked with them with that. Well, Barnabas was born on the island. So when he goes there, he has uh, these inroads in places like the proconsul or the governor uh, there, the Roman governor of the island and, uh, you know, synagogue, I'm sure, and other places. So uh, uh, Barnabas is uh, again that wisdom that's there to pick the place he knows it's not fully uh evangelized uh, at this point even though it's a, a smaller piece of the world but there's people that are lost and they need the lord and uh there's people kind of on the cusp uh you know kind of wanting to know more and uh, so barnabas uh, starts it there yeah, Bar Barnabas takes him basically to his home turf, you know what I mean? So like you said, uh, he knows, he, uh, if you're going to go out on an outreach mission, it's always good to know where you're going. <laughs> and Barnabas, having grown up from being from that area, would have known exactly where to go. And, and I, I loaded up uh, two maps on Facebook that show the, the routes for this, these first two sort of sections of uh, 13. And, and the, the one thing that Barnabas knew is there was at least a decent sized Jewish community there because in verse five, it talks about them going to the synagogues, meaning with, with an S. And uh, so Barnabas had to have those connections as they're, they're going along. And when we, when we get to, uh, you know, a little after verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, we get this, this, great, this great character, this, uh, you know, they're with the high government of the land, the proconsul, you know, so this is a, a, a position uh, of authority in the island. And we get this uh, bar Jesus, um, who is, you know, you're seeing this, I think you're seeing the spiritual warfare part going on here, you know, uh, and this bar Jesus is trying to make sure that the pro council doesn't hear this message, but the pro council wants to hear this message. And why don't you talk a little bit about that and, and, uh, you know, what's going on there, uh, with, 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 our Jesus. <laughs> um, well, uh, you mentioned it, and that's that uh, uh, spiritual warfare, if you will, and, and uh, access to power, and uh, you know, being able to be—it's uh, kind of like what was going on with uh, Simon in the previous uh, stories. Uh, somebody who uh, had some sort of influence by the way they did things but it was not from uh, the Lord, that's for sure. And uh, it, it, with, um, with uh, Sir Gaius Paulus, you have a proconsul or governor who could be uh, the kind of person that Luke is writing to, both the gospel and this volume to the book of Acts, because uh, he... He uses the term uh, Theophilus, uh, which is it could be a person's name, uh, very possibly in that uh, realm. And he uses the term Your Excellency in the opening. And that's the term you use with a governor when you're writing them as the official address in the Roman times. So uh, interestingly enough, they start there. Uh, the story moves us there to somebody that the, uh, the who's receiving the book of Acts can uh, easily relate to uh, in this mission. And uh, and part of the reason for possibly writing the book of Acts was to have a handbook to hand 
that governor or any Roman governor for that matter, as they made copies, to say, hey, here's what's going on in uh, the way in, uh, with Christians, with this, with the church, and here's why you shouldn't fear it. In fact, you should see uh, tribunes, uh, centurions, um, uh, governors uh, have all uh, caught on and, and believe this was something they themselves should be a part of as it's widening out to the world from the Jewish population to uh, the Gentile population. And in this part, Jesus, who, uh, you know, he's called a, mus a, a magician, uh, interest, uh, interest, or at least in, in the uh, NASB, he's called a magician. And if you look at that word, uh, it, it's a very similar word to magi or counselor right. that you got in, uh, right. in Babylonian times. But, but Paul, Paul hasn't mellowed out very much in the last no. decade or so because in verse nine one of my favorite ones is, is he fixes his gaze on on um <laughs> yeah exactly fixes his gaze on this guy and uh, for lack of a better term just our own you know terminology he goes off <laughs> all right this is this this is like getting on the community facebook page and just going off <laughs> because he, you are the enemy of everything that's right. You are the child of the devil. You're, I mean, he's like, woo! He's I like, mean, uh, tell him the truth, you know, I speaking mean, the truth. And I don't know if it's in love or not here, but he's, he's going <laughs> off on it, right? It's well, he, love for the other people and for the, and for the pro council, no doubt, because if this is the kind of person that has influence there, he's saying, hey, get this guy out of here or you're in for it. Well, listen, Paul hasn't written Galatians yet, so we do not have the fruit of the spirits at this point. <laughs> so, so he and, and Galatians is the nastiest of them all. Yeah, that's absolutely he, right. He hasn't mellowed quite yet. Oh, no, he, he goes off. I mean, he just absolutely, utterly goes off on this guy. And this, you know, yeah. the strange thing is uh, the pro council believes you know because he he blinds the guy he puts him into darkness i mean how great is that don't you wish we had that power today it's like poof <laughs> we might we're just none of us we've mellowed to the point where we don't go uh strike somebody like that anymore but hey i imagine there's times and places where it it, it may be needed well, and I'll be honest with you, I got I to gotta give Paul a little bit of a break because uh, this is where this Saul, also known as Paul, now before he fixes his gaze, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. So this, this is righteous. He's not, he's not off on his own. Yes. He's, <laughs> the Holy righteous. Spirit's going off on this guy through him. <laughs> this, this is righteous indignation. <laughs> so, yeah, true and, enough. And he goes off on him. And yeah. the pro council, we find out, believes, and, and then they pick up and leave, leave town, you know, um, and, and go on to the next synagogue. And uh, we get down to the, the next synagogue and really... Well, this... And before you go there, okay. before you go to the next synagogue, I, I would want to point out that um, uh, here we get this uh, interesting switch of names for, yeah. for Saul and Paul that we've continued to, it, it, we call him Paul so often all the rest of the time now, uh, but so Paul uh, starts the story, and by the end of the story, it's Paul and his companions uh, take off. Uh, and, and the deal is, uh, first of all, it's from Saul to Paul, or Shaul, who would be the Hebrew way to pronounce that, from uh, Shaul to Paul, or Paulus, and it's the exact same name as the governor they've just been with, Sergius Paulus. And uh, it's often wondered, and I, I think uh, rightfully so, that in this encounter, in this story here, uh, Paul grabs onto his Roman or his Gentile identity, because that's the, the, the Roman name that would be the equivalent for Shaul or Saul. And it's it, it, they probably joked about it even that uh hey i'm paul too and they and they started uh you know this conversation about it but uh 
here he claims that yeah. identity because as they go into and in, in this ministry paul from his conversion experience knows god's got a plan for him he's he's a chosen one and uh and the guy who came to his house ananias to uh lay hands on him and, and heal him uh is the one who uh gets this message that paul has this mission to the gentile world he's chosen for it and uh uh, I, he chooses right here. He grabs onto it and decides that's how I'm going to be known because it'll be more of an entree uh, when he steps into a Roman governor's place to be called by his Roman name. And, uh, you know, this is the part of the transition of the whole book of Acts. Well, and, and I think I think Luke is definitely telegraphing where we're going here because mm -hmm. as we make this trip, you know, down the coast uh, to the basically the southern tip that, that we're moving across here, um he's telegraphing at this point i'm paul i'm roman gentile and guess where that this message is going uh because as he makes this trip and as he goes to um this next synagogue to give this amazing big picture uh sermon we're going to find out that, you know, in a couple of weeks, I guess, you know, the next Sunday or the following uh, Saturday, I should say, that when he starts quoting Isaiah and taking the message to the Gentiles, it's, it's not going to be taken very well. But before we get there, let's talk about this amazing uh, sermon from Paul. It's another one of these one, it's another one of these sermons I love that are just broad, you know, here is where everything's leading, you know, and let me show you the way. Uh, so t tell us the story, this great sermon of Paul's. Uh, and it's true. Now, I'm going to, I'm not going to go to the synagogue yet. Because okay. I, I got one more thing that occurred right. to me that, uh, well, you take, you uh, take it wasn't in my the synagogue. <laughs> yeah, this is the, the Holy Spirit, but, uh, Paul is very comfortable with this whole switch. It's not like a switch for him because the number one customer uh, for the tent making, I call it the recreational vehicle making uh, world of the first century were Roman soldiers and the centurions who were, uh, or those who were financing their uh, cohorts, their troops. And so, his family business that he grew up with in Tarsus and which he was just pulled from uh, by Barnabas to come to Antioch, uh, that's their world. And he, I'm, he was already using Paulus, no doubt, with that, his customers uh, and that customer base that they're working with. And the people that are traveling are usually have to be wealthy uh, often. And th there is no, if you're traveling on a, on a ship uh, with a fastest way to travel in that Mediterranean world, you had no quarters for yourself. There were no cruise ships, no passenger ships. If you wanted any privacy, you had to have a tent. You had to have a, a some kind of compartment or some kind of lean-to uh, down in the hold uh, to have any privacy at all. And so uh, again, his customers were uh, very often travelers and people traveling that world. And so uh, being in this Roman governor's uh, place was probably not uncomfortable. And taking on that Roman name was not a, even though he had been in Jerusalem, was known as Shaul, was Gamaliel's student at the, you know, the uh, Hebrew University there in, in Jerusalem, if you will. Uh, he, he, his a previous life and identity and then back to it uh, when he went back home is is in that Roman world and so he's he's the bridge and and again Barnabas being the guy to note note that from the beginning and to continue to uh, mentor Paul uh, to see him carry the hope and the torch of uh, the light of Jesus Christ into that world was was pretty amazing so Let's go to the let's go to the synagogue now, unless you want to say anything off of what I just. Said. Well, you know, I actually, you know, as you're saying that, maybe what we're finding out is Paul's getting back to his comfort zone. You know what I mean? Because yeah. here Barnabas has come; they've just come from Jerusalem, 
you know, maybe what we're seeing here is instead of it being a new thing that he is going by Paul, that he's getting back to going by Paul. That when you're sitting there talking about great that, insight. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. So because where 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 does Barnabas at least where does the story take him first? He takes him to the governor's place, and uh, you know he's taking him into where he knows uh, uh, Saul has an identity already that he's got and he has a comfort zone there and knows how to speak with them. And so, yeah, it, it's, it, it again, uh, there was gifting here that we, we tend to not realize because we don't know the interconnections between uh, the first century people often, but uh, in the trade and the, the status, et cetera. But Paul was, wow, just like, God, God knew he was choosing the, the right person, and no matter how he resisted, or how anybody else resisted, yeah. or how much uh, spiritual warfare was going on, uh, Paul wasn't going to back down. Yeah, God's not often surprised. <laughs> <laughs> the hound of heaven, he's been called at the time. <laughs> All right, get on the boat. Get down get to the, on the boat. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, get on the boat. Well, okay, so they, they take off. And they're sailing. This is a second sailing voyage already that we get told about. I, I drew a little uh, stick uh, sails, sailing ship uh, in my notes every time they get on a boat and they're sailing. But uh, they go uh, and they there's this uh, paragraph packed with peas. Yeah. Uh, Paphos and Paul and uh, Perga and Pamphylia. And notice here in this uh, paragraph, Paul is mentioned first. In fact, the NIV 84 says Paul and his companions doesn't yep. even mention Barnabas and John Mark at this point. Uh, just says Paul and his companions, at, and uh, they uh, uh, and this is where when they get to the next port, Perga in Pamphylia. This is where John Mark ditches. So I'm not at the synagogue yet, but this is big. Because yeah, it's going to come up again, yep. and, and it's going to come up again, <laughs> and this is something to pay attention to, because uh, where it, we're going to find out in later chapters, I just kind of whet your appetite for it, is uh, uh, though Barnabas, uh, we will find out in later letters by Paul, is the uncle of, of John Mark, and has more patience with John Mark. Paul will want nothing to do with them for a long time. Uh, but that's not the end of the story, and so we'll, we'll leave it at that. Well, Paul, Paul doesn't strike me as the patient type. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and that could be part of this problem, and, yep. and that Barnabas, as named the encourager by the apostles, is this magnanimous person who uh, knows uh, diplomacy, knows how to cheer people on and Paul like goes right to the hole in the t-shirt and rips the t-shirt open you know uh, he, he's Paul, Paul is not necessarily diplomatic at this early uh, juncture and so as we pointed out earlier uh, John Mark might have gone I can't believe it <laughs> and takes off we don't know they never tell us uh, what the uh, reason is that John Mark leaves here and goes all the way back to Jerusalem yeah. but uh, it's um, it, there's something going on in Paul, and Paul is not ready to uh, have any patience with him from here on out for quite a few years. Yeah, and we we were talking earlier, uh, just on my own. I was trying to think of, okay, how old um, is John Mark? Because if he's a younger guy, does youth have something to do with it? And I'm just going to give you a quick little thing. You know, this Paul's first missionary trip was probably between 48 and 50 AD. We know John Mark was around at 33 AD when Jesus was crucified. So, and, and he's, he's probably a young kid there. Think if he's 15 years old. Well, if he's 15 years old, uh, you know, he's in his 30s uh, at this point, or, you know, late 20s, early 30s, somewhere in that neighborhood. So he's not a young guy. You know what I mean? Uh, so, yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if. Uh, uh, well, I'll use the I'll use the saying that Dr. J. Vernon McGee says: 
uh, John Mark is a mama's boy, and mm. he wanted to get back to mama. So <laughs> you're living at home, maybe in the basement. Maybe he's a millennial. Oh, we can't do that. That's terrible, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> we just lost one of our audience now. <laughs> yeah, forgive me for that. That 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 was too good to, to pass up. But yeah, uh, I, I I'm the one that always talks about me being the old guy too. So know that I know how uh, old and prejudiced I am. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, we're politically incorrect. I, I hope I'm not prejudiced, but I, I can be politically incorrect. <laughs> well, it just depends on your politics. Uh, so, <laughs> so, 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 so we're finally across the across the, the way here. John Mark and, and I put a map on uh, Facebook of this uh, coming out of Logo Software because I found it amazing how long of a journey it would have been for John Mark uh, to come way back down, probably through Caesarea and then back down to Jerusalem. I mean, that's a, it's a long trip by himself. So yeah, something happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, the, they parted ways. That's for sure. And not on, not on good terms, evidently, yeah. as we find out as the story goes. Yeah. So uh, there, uh, it, what's uh, interesting is, uh, uh, I've always thought it was interesting, and I did a little more reading, uh, but uh, we have two Antiochs, and both those Antiochs are uh, in this chapter and key to this chapter, and that you have Antioch in Syria, uh, which is a, a little younger of the town, and Antioch in Pisidia, which is the older of the two, and they're, they both come out of the generals and their uh, families that were under Alexander the Great 300 years earlier when, the, when Alexander the Great uh, died uh, tragically uh, on his quest. Uh, and uh, the generals started to decide to split things up and fight amongst themselves for uh, leadership in the territories from then on. And they started founding cities and uh, these two are like sister cities, you could say, different generations founding them, but the uh, same family, the Seleucid uh, family of kings. And uh, they're, so they're, they're related in, in, in kind of a way in sister cities. And so, uh, uh, and maybe that relationship right there gave them an entree uh, in the going there to go to the synagogue and, and st start off there again. So uh, you, you want to talk more about the, the sermon and what's going on there? Well, uh, no, I'll let you talk about it. I mean, I, okay. to me, it's just the most amazing and very consistent with mm -hmm. what we've seen throughout. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I know you'll touch on it, uh, Paul knows his audience. Mm -hmm. when, when he's talking, this message is a message to a Jewish community. Uh, you know, obviously he's in the synagogue, but he goes through, you know, Moses, Abraham, you know, he goes through what will resonate with them. Of course, he also goes and gives them scripture that won't resonate with <laughs> them. But, right. but uh, yeah, talk about the, the, the sermon. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, in the video shows something that you might not catch at the moment as you're watching it. And that is at the very beginning of the sermon as uh, uh, they invited him to uh, speak a word of encouragement uh, to them. You'd think uh, Paul uh, would defer to the guy that's named encouragement, uh, Barnabas, but he goes on, and I'm impressed with the acting in this one because uh, Paul is very much an encourager. The way he delivers it, he's delivering it with a smile. He's, de he's delivering it very positively as he goes through uh, the, the Old Testament and through what's going on, but at the very beginning of it, uh, he addresses them as men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God. And when uh, he's saying the, those words, you Gentiles who worship God, the camera goes to the window, which remember, there's no glass then as far as a window, but there was a screen there and there's a bunch of people out there. Well, that's where these Gentiles are, who are a uh, God fears is another term for them. And it'll get used a couple more times in this chapter. Uh, where they are, they are sympathetic, they believe uh, in this God, but they don't do the full conversion experience or the 
we might call it in our translating it to our world they don't become members they don't become a full member of the the church they're just those regular attenders who are there well they didn't get to sit inside the synagogue uh, in this case, they had to be outside uh, the screen, and they had a smaller screen there. Sometimes, you know, it could be a bigger setup, depending on how many there are. And, and in these kinds of cities, there were evidently quite a few. And uh, it was uh, something Paul knew, like you said, his audience well, because uh, he was speaking, and he addresses both groups of people, not just that one. But both groups of people... Uh, uh, even the Jew, the Jewish uh, by birth members may have known these stories from being on the knee of, you know, their family and learning them uh, in a synagogue school uh, and et cetera, uh, because literacy and learning uh, how to read and write through the Bible was uh, the way they, they went. But for the others, they might have known these stories, and they may not have known them that well, but uh, he goes through the story and, and starts, uh, you know, with uh, back into Egypt, and he doesn't mention Moses' name, unusually enough. He just talks about them, uh, you know, being in Egypt, being chosen there, going into the desert, going uh, into Canaan, and uh, having judges and then asking for a king and getting kings and and finally uh, a king that is worthy and that's david and that that's who he mentions the first me person he mentions is samuel who is the prophet that uh picks the kings and then it's david uh as the rest of the story will go who has a descendant uh and that's he gets to jesus right there when he's at david this descendant who's the savior uh, Jesus, Israel's Savior, and uh, as he promised, and uh, then he, he's right to Jesus. He just starts talking about John the Baptist and Jesus, and then he restates again his audience, uh, children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles. So he's again uh, making sure they know he's talking to them too. The people of Jerusalem, the rulers, uh, didn't recognize Jesus, it fulfilled uh, the words of the prophets that we read every Sabbath, and that's uh, the still the case today. If you were to go to a synagogue service, they read from the Torah, they read from the prophet uh, every every Sunday, every Sabbath, or every Saturday for them, every Sabbath, and uh, they're carried. Uh, they he explains about uh, Pilate and uh, Jesus dying. Jesus raising, God raised him. You know, that's that's another thing uh, we haven't talked about, but uh, the term that the New Testament uses, there's so much, so rich here. The term the New Testament uses about the resurrection is that God raised Jesus from the dead, not that Jesus rose necessarily. Most of the time, notice, it says God raised him from the dead, and which is a uh, uh, it, 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 that larger picture of what God's, he talked about what God's been doing for thousands of years, and then it, it, God's still uh, a part of this with that person that God has become. And so uh, it, it's an interesting way to talk, but uh, he, he goes for it. And then uh, we tell you the good news. That's the key right there. Verse 32 is the the basic bottom line for what uh, Paul and Barnabas are up to. <coughs> Excuse me. We tell you the good news. What God has promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us in raising Jesus. So it's like, wow, you know, <laughs> it's uh, here we are. And we're at that point. That's where he quotes the scripture. As you were mentioning, he, he quotes uh, a couple of Psalms and in between, it's kind of a Psalm sandwich here with uh, Isaiah being the meat. Yep. Uh, Psalm 2 verse uh, seven, you're my son today. I've become your father. Uh, Isaiah 55 3 about the, the decay, and I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David uh, that the body's never decayed and uh, stated in those words. And then uh, Psalm 16 10, uh, you will let your you will not let your holy one decay. Uh, so, uh, it's an interesting uh set of uh things he goes on to talk about david who served his purpose in his generation but the one whom god raised from the dead that's the one i'm bringing to you today and uh, uh boom 
So he, he goes right to Jesus. Uh, he's gone. He's recognized where he is, and he uses the scriptures, uh, in an, uh, the story from the scriptures, and then quotes from the scripture to uh, back up how this Jesus uh, is talked about in, uh, his, in the scriptures itself uh, by David uh, himself and by the prophets. And then uh, he, he's there and says that last line that Paul, it's not surprising to hear Paul say it, look, you scoffers, wonder and perish. <laughs> he's had the smile on his face the whole time. And uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, the uh, actor in this particular case and the director choose to have him do this more pensively. Yes. Because you can do this with that uh, yeah. hellfire and brimstone voice, but he does it a little more pensively, at least, at least in this uh, particular uh, situation. And, uh, you know, uh, says, uh, uh, I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you, you're gonna, you will perish if you're a scoffer. And, uh, you know, uh, so if, you're not, if you don't believe it, you know, good luck. <laughs> and, and, and he's quoting Habakkuk there, which, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a rough message. <laughs> but mm -hmm. the thing that amazes me uh, is he goes through this message. And again, I think the, uh, the video portrays it in a very, uh, a very nice, pleasant, mm -hmm. encouraging, uplifting message. And, but, and, and so, you know, after the Sabbath, we're, everything's fine you know, relatively speaking, it's not until we get to the next Sabbath that all of a sudden there's jealousy and envy of the Jews. Now, you got to imagine during the week, Paul and Barnabas and, and John Mark, or no, John Mark's gone, sorry, Paul and Barnabas and whoever's there with him are not just sitting there in the fields, you know, sun tanning themselves for the whole week. They're out given the message and obviously the the crowds because it says the whole city assembled mm -hmm. uh to hear well, the, and yeah they invited them to come yeah. back and they invited and so them to they, come back they, yeah. they were no doubt uh publicizing that they're going to come back uh in the sense that you know they uh, kind of sent the word out and the like you said these guys are working it uh to invite people i'm sure to be there and uh yeah the a few people that didn't like it and had the parking lot conversation uh, invited some of their friends and uh, yeah, it wasn't as friendly that next time. Yeah, well, and it's sort of interesting because not only was it not as friendly, but you, you get the feeling uh, that the passionate Paul uh, who was gazing in the eyes of, of Bar Jesus, you know, a, a boat ride ago is back <laughs> because uh you know we get some folks that are giving them a hard time how's that i mean it's probably about the most politically correct thing i can say uh and yeah well because uh, he answers in verse 46 is it yeah uh, we had to speak the word of god to you first since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of what we had to say, well, we're going to turn to the Gentiles now. So, adios, synagogue. And uh, it's like, oh my, yeah. So, just imagine yourself as a evangelist guest pre preacher who's going from church to church, and on the second day of revival, <laughs> say, hey. I had to give you that message last week or, or yesterday, but you're not worthy because you don't want it. You don't think you deserve it. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go. We'll hear part two today. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go next door. <laughs> so, so me, you, again, a li little bit of in your mind thinking, if he's inside in the synagogue when he's saying these first lines, He's probably gone out of the synagogue, and the people that were looking into the synagogue before are now outside with him, and he's like, let's go, because yeah. we Yeah, and it says, it. you're right, uh, it says, uh, verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, uh, and uh, they believed, you know, yep. uh, there was the uh, eternal life uh, uh, promised to them, uh, and th they're, they're praising the Lord. Uh, but, uh, and it says the word of the Lord spread 
spread through the whole region. So obviously this this was like good news all the way for those who were the God fearers, those who were outside of it. And uh, but the Jewish response, mm, verse fifty. <laughs> yeah, um, we're both looking at each other, going, "Who's going to say it first? Yeah. Well, they, they, let's just say they incited uh, some of the leading people of the city, both men and women, yep. and they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. So we're told in verse 49 that the word of the Lord spread throughout the region, but not necessarily with Paul and Barnabas because they got kicked out of the region, not just the town. Well, and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and they do something that the other folks would, would understand. Well, and uh, so they drive them out of the city and very much like Jesus said with his disciples, if these people don't accept you, leave their house. And what do they do? And I love the way they portrayed it in the, in the film. We're just going to get the dust off of our sandals. <laughs> and and bye-bye. <laughs> Shake the dust off your feet and uh, on to the next place. You know, on to the yeah, next place. Uh, uh, and, and it says the disciples and it just says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not specific, but there's the Holy Spirit and joy. And your uh, the assumption is that it's the people in, in Antioch and that whole region where things had spread through. There's, uh, there's a, like a this time of celebration going on that uh, even though there's also some consternation, shall we say, among some people, there's uh, the joy of the Lord. Yeah, uh, that's going on. Well, just you know, just think of some of these encounters that we've had. Uh, you know, we go all the way back to when uh, Peter and John uh, healed healed the, the the man you know that was the, uh, on the stairs at the temple, and he jumps for joy. You know, um, you 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 think of uh, the Ethiopian who uh, basically got baptized and he was you know that that scene where he's just laughing you know mm -hmm. there's something um there's something about a body of believers together in unity um that there's joy there <laughs> i mean there's mm -hmm. just there's just joy there mm -hmm. um you don't have to pick up Piper. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're taping a little later today because oh. we've done a lot of talking uh, oh, I know. before yeah. this today, and that's that's the signal to pick up Riley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, the, for for everybody that has made it this far, I mean, when when we get started, we you know we sort of talk through it, and today we, we talked through it until about it felt like eight o'clock. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, so. We, we yeah, will never record the session. Well, and, and, and it also surprises me with the last couple of chapters because I had a lot more notes and a lot more things to, written, prepared for the chapters before this, but not these last couple ones. They were more kind of straightforward, it seemed. But the more we talk about it and the more we get into it, it's like, wow, this is really, you know, it's, it's, it's like watching the unfolding of something that you love to watch and oh. you start to see new things and put new things together every time you go through it you, you know what i feel like sometimes i feel like the director who is watching a movie that he directed now we didn't mm -hmm. direct this obviously mm -hmm. but does the commentary i mean honestly if if we were if you sat and wanted to do uh, you know exegesis on this for for a sermon series chapter 13 could probably be a good two or three months <laughs> sermon series. I mean, there's just so much there. Uh, and, and, and I mean, you can pick, I mean, it, that's the great thing. You could pick out one little detail and go for a long time. So, yeah. But there's something to be said to, to also see it in such a rapid fashion, like we're doing a chapter a day and that you see the more, the grand sweep yeah. uh, as well of where, where it started and where it's going. And, uh, how it, each each of the stages it, it's so well uh, written by Luke, uh, where each of these things uh, lead to the next, and uh, you see that I'm sure Luke was 
also astounded and had great joy in sharing the story because and, and the way uh, Dean Jones, the actor in the film plays Luke, he has that joy as he's telling the story, whether he's just telling the one person, the, the scribe that's writing it, or whether he's telling it to a whole group of people. Uh, he's enjoying as he's, I think, you know, it's unfolding in his uh, mind. And you, when you retell things, you uh, experience them again anew. And uh, the joy, uh, the joy of the Lord is definitely there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, we made it through chapter thirteen, but obviously we are not done no. with with the the first uh, missionary trip. So they're still out there. They're still out there. So we're we're gonna leave them where they're at. Uh, they have just gotten kicked out of the city, uh, and uh, we'll They've pick. Shaken the dust off their feet, and they went to Iconium. So they're in in Iconium, wherever that is. Well, look at your map. We'll figure and, uh, out more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so uh, it's just it's just fascinating. And and again, uh, we're going to end up because if, if this trip took two years, we're going to end up at the council in Jerusalem, uh, really figuring out the whole Gentile issue. Uh, and it's just amazing how this is playing off. And uh, there you go. Absolutely. And I, I might mention something. I'll mention it today and mention it uh, tomorrow is uh, what I think on Sunday, what I'd encourage people to do besides being in the uh, your progress. class of Pilgrim's Progress is uh, take, uh, if you're going to watch a movie this weekend, watch the, f uh, up till we've gotten uh, like 13, tomorrow we'll be in 14 and then, and then Saturday 15, depending on where you are, just watch this movie in its entirety. You can go to, there's a website, and maybe Chris, if you haven't uh, tagged that website. I'll post it up, yeah. Where the movie is in its entirety. We've just been, you've been skillfully taking each chapter and, and capturing it and, and putting it in. And uh, the, this, but to watch it now in the grand sweep of things, it, it's, a, it's a three hour plus film if you watch the whole book all at once. But it's like a normal hour and a half to two hour movie to get this first uh, part of Acts in uh, this weekend. So I, I'd encourage you for the celebrating uh, shelter in place ending is shelter in place for another couple hours and watch this movie at least through verse uh, through chapter 13 or 14. Yep. Well, we'll get through 15 on Saturday. And, and so. get what's gone on uh, to this point in the grand sweep of things, because it's a new, it, it gives you new insight just to see it uh, in that one sitting. Yes, absolutely. And uh, with that, uh, I, you know, would, would, you got a good prayer sitting there? <laughs> I do. Uh, uh, now, uh, let's see. Prayer Bible. Uh, we we kind of highlighted that before, too. And uh uh, I'm going to stitch the prayer that's at the beginning of this chapter uh, into the prayer that's at the end of the chapter. And uh, Lord, teach me to listen to your whole voice for direction to my life, just as the leaders in Antioch and Syria sought your will for their life and ministry. I will seek your will in my life. But when you speak, Give me ears to hear what you want me to do and give me the strength to choose to do your will. And then as he ends uh, the chapter, uh, well, actually, it's even uh, before that. It's uh, kind of in the middle of the chapter. He, he prays and we pray, Lord, help us realize many people are hungry for the good news that Jesus forgives sins, gives eternal life, and gives a abundant satisfaction in their lives. And so we just pray, Lord, that you use us uh, and use uh, who we are and, and use our comfort zone. Sometimes we talk about uh, going into places that aren't our comfort zones, but in this case, Paul and uh, Barnabas uh, take it sometimes into comfort zones and sometimes outside the comfort zone, both. And the Lord uses the whole Holy Spirit uses those situations with the people that are around that you've sent us to, to the people that you've sent to us. And so we ask you to use us 
so that we're spreading the good news and that there is joy found in the Lord Jesus in other people's lives as well as ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. We'll see you tomorrow for chapter 14. Sounds good. And everybody go out and enjoy tomorrow. Uh, you're free. <laughs>